Greetings, everyone. We're glad you could join us today for the ErgoMed webinar titled Brexit and its impact on clinical trials being run in the UK. My name is Philomena O'Brien and I'm the Marketing Manager at ErgoMed. Before we start, we'd like to run through a couple of quick housekeeping matters. Firstly, we expect this webinar presentation to run for approximately 30 minutes with a short amount of time for questions and answers at the end. And secondly, you're very welcome to send us your questions at any point throughout the presentation, and you can do this by typing them into the Q&A section that you will see on your screen. And now, I'd like to introduce our expert speaker, Louise Bracewell, who is Ergomed's Senior Regulatory Affairs Manager. Louise has over 12 years of experience in the field of regulatory affairs, managing and supporting multinational phase two to four studies in a variety of indications through regulatory affairs processes from initial applications to CSR submission. Louise, welcome, and I'll let you take over from here. Thank you, Philomena, for your welcome and introduction. Uh, welcome everyone to the webinar today. Um, as you can see from our agenda, we will be looking at the legislation and guidance, the impact on ongoing studies, uh, setting up new studies, and the MHRA submissions portal. We'll walk through and, and talk about the registration process for this new portal. So for legislation, um, as you can see, we have the uh, Medicines for Human Use regulations in place at the moment. And post-Brexit, we will have these uh, this same regulation, but uh, amended with EU exit information. Um, and also the clinical trials regulation will not be applicable to the UK anymore. It will not be implemented before Brexit, as we know. Um, and the UK is updating its national regulations to bring them in line with the clinical trials regulation. The MHRA will also regulate for trials um, in Northern Ireland post-Brexit. So here we see the guidance issued. Several bodies have issued guidance. You can see that the guidance from MHRA, EU and national competence authorities. The, e the MHRA guidance is on its website and it's updated regularly. So this is where you can get the most up-to-date information and it covers a wide variety of topics. The EU has issued two statements um, and these mainly concern um, sponsor responsibilities and IMP supply. And several national competent authorities have also issued guidance to sponsors and CROs for trials, including UK sites. And again, this covers sponsor responsibility and import of IMP. I'm just going to mention briefly um, the combined ways of working and VHP. Um, the combined ways of working is a pilot scheme in the UK whereby you submit your clinical trial application to the MHRA and the Ethics Committee as a single submission. There will be no change to the current process due to Brexit for the CWAW. Um, it's only available at the moment to a small number of companies, but the UK will be scaling this up in the next year and it will make it available to all. Regarding the VHP, um, the UK obviously can no longer participate from the 1st of January 2021. If you have a VHP ongoing at this time, the MHRA will take this into consideration. You may need to make a separate submission, however, um, if this is the case, the MHRA recommend that you give them all the information that you have from your VHP process from other countries to the MHRA, and they will take this into consideration with their decisions. So now we're going to look at the impacts from Brexit on ongoing studies. And the first impact is the sponsor and legal representative location. So if you are an EU sponsor and you have UK and EU sites, there are no changes needed. If you are a UK sponsor and you have UK and EU sites, you will need to set up a legal representative based in the EU or EEA for your EU sites. Um, this should be done via a substantial amendment to the concerned member states, but you do not need to notify the MHRA about this. 
and this amendment should be made to the ethics and to the regulatory. Uh, for rest of world sponsors, we have the following two scenarios. If you have a legal representative in the UK and you have a study with sites in the UK and EU, you need to ensure that you have a legal representative based in the EU and EEA for your EU sites. This again needs to be made by a substantial amendment to the concerned member states. And this amendment needs to be approved before the 1st of January 2021. And that also goes for um, EU and UK sponsors. Uh, for the rest of the world, uh, legal representatives in the EU, UK and EU sites, there's no change. The UK accepts legal representatives in the EU. So for maintenance activities related to your ongoing studies, the biggest change is that we can no longer submit via the CESP portal. Um, all submissions must go via the MHRA submissions portal. We can still use the same notice of substantial amendment form, the same end of trial notification forms. Um, there's no change to the documents required for submission and there's also no change to the REC and Re Health Research Authority submission process. Regarding clinical study reports, um, the notification is the same as it was before. So you would upload UDRAC results into the database and notify the MHRA once this is done. A uh, quick mention about safety. Um, for SUSARs, you can only submit via the MHRA gateway. It's the same information needed and the same timelines. For DSURs, there is no change except that you have to submit by the MHRA submissions portal. Um, and now we're going to look at um, IMP supply. So there's two scenarios that we have here. You could have um, a trial with sites in the UK where your IMP is QP released in the EU. And you could have trial sites in the EU where your IMP is released in the UK. So for the first scenario, if your QP is on an approved country list, which at the moment is all EU and EEA countries, you don't need to recertify. Um, you do, however, need in place a UK manufacturer or importer's authorization holder for, for oversight of the supply chain role. This is a new role um, and there are 12 months to implement this. This must be submitted via substantial amendment to the MHRA. Um, the UDRAT form would need to be amended in Section D and also the IMP should be amended if possible. If the timelines don't allow you to update your IMPD, then you can make a um, cover letter and describe the oversight of supply chain role in there as a instead of updating your IMPD. And then if you have um, <clears throat> trial sites in the EU with UK QP release, you do need to ensure and establish a QP in the EU. And this again needs to be submitted via substantial amendment. So if you are um, importing NIMPs or unmodified comparators, um, if they are from a listed country, uh, you need a wholesale dealer license. Um, existing license holders have six months period for notification, a two year period for naming a responsible person for import. But new license holder applicants must have the responsible person for import from the 1st of January, 2021. And if you're importing from a third country, there are no changes to this process. So now we're moving on to look at new studies and any impacts on these. So new studies running in the UK. So regarding your initial submissions, we can see here that there are some changes and some things remain unchanged. Uh, the clinical trial application should be made via the MHRA submission portal. Uh, the UDRAC form should now be completed via the IRAS system. Um, and it's a UK ethics requirement that um, any studies are registered on public databases. If you have a UK only study, um, you can no longer use the UDRAC database. Um, so another database must be utilized, such as clinicaltrials.gov. Um, you may also need to consider the location of your legal representative. Um, if the sponsor is in the UK and if you also have um, sites in the EU. 
And the QP release, um, we would advise that you discuss this um, with your CMO. Remaining unchanged is the documents that you need for submission. Um, in the short term, the MHRA is asking that you still obtain a UJAC number for your study, even if it's UK only study. The timelines for review and opinion by the MHRA and UK Ethics Service remain the same. Um, GDPR requirements also remain the same. Um, the GDPR was written into UK law via the Data Protection Act in 2018. So the terminology in your ICF uh, with, the sec with regards to sections, patient confidentiality and privacy remains the same as it was before Brexit. So maintenance activities for new studies. Um, so your amendments, your end of trial notification, your DSUR would need to be submitted via the MHRA submission portal. The forms, you can still use the um, EU forms, the declaration of end of trial, the notification of substantial amendment form. Clinical study reports. Um, so you would upload your results into UDRACT in the same way as previously and notify the MHRA once completed. This would be for studies um, that have UK and U EU sites. If you have a UK only study, you would need to update the database where you registered the study and notify the MHRA along with a summary clinical study report. So now we're going to look at the MHRA submissions portal, um, first the roles and then the registration process. So you can see here there's two roles, administrator and user. Um, you should carefully consider who completes the registration. Um, as you see at the bottom here, the person registering becomes the company administrator and they have visibility of all submissions. Um, they control the addition of new users and they can create departmental teams. This is great if you have a large company, you may want to have a team for regulatory submissions, for clinical trial submissions and for pharmacovigilance. Users have visibility of their own submissions and obviously they have the ability to make submissions as well. Users can also be internal or external. So the first step for registration, um, you can see here, um, I'm going to go over very briefly this process, but the MHRA has issued guidance videos and some really good step-by-step -step instructions. Those are available on their website. So if you get stuck at all, then please see those. So this is for um, sponsor or CRO registration, and you complete this form to get started. This is the MHRA account request form. You would only complete the mandatory fields in this form. And when it comes to organization role, you need to select authorized representative. Um, the next bit, um, you will be emailed an invitation with a link by Microsoft um, and just follow the instructions to create a password and to verify your email address. If you already have a Microsoft account, you can use this and therefore not all the steps in this part will be relevant. And the last um, part of the registration process is that you will be sent to a web page where you see this and you need to click on medicines and e-cigarettes. And before you complete the last step, you need to ensure that you have your five digit company ready, your five digit company number ready and just follow the instructions. And when it comes to organization details, you enter your five digit company registration. So once you've registered, um, then you can um, add users and, and manage your users. Um, there's a user management tile for this. Um, if you click on your company number, that takes you to the area on the portal where you can add users. So there's, uh, as I mentioned earlier, internal and external users. So for uh, internal users, you add new user, enter their details, click add user and send request. They will then get an email with a link for them to complete their registration and get access to the portal. For external users, um, an external user, for example, would be um, the CRO of a sponsor. And the external user permissions are important. Um, the administrator can control who they add to their company. They can manage the users and set permissions and see all company submissions. So you need to enter their details 
and you must enter the same email as the one used by the company when they registered with the MHRA. And then you set their permissions and then click add user and send request. So this is just the screenshot of the home page um, of the MHRA portal. So you can see this portal goes live on the 1st of January 2021. Currently, only the FAQ and the user management titles are available. And once it's gone live um, and when you start making submissions for your clinical trials, you would use the human medicines tab. That's all from my presentation today. Um, I'll hand back over to you, Philomena. Thanks, Louise. Um, okay, I can see we have quite a few questions that have come in while you've been talking. So let's see if we can answer some of them now while we still have a little bit of time left. Um, okay, first I'll read out a question. Okay, we have one here from a pharmaceutical company that's based in the EU. The question is, do we need a UK MIA IMP holder for the oversight of supply chain role if QP certification takes place in Northern Ireland? I'll pass that over to you, Louise. Thanks, Philomena. Um, no, there is no requirement for this. So the Northern Ireland protocol ensures that, the, um, that Northern Ireland maintains their regulatory alignment with the EU laws, especially concerning medicinal products. So therefore, the QP, QP release performed in Northern Ireland is accepted by the UK and the EU. Great, thank you. Um, okay, next we have a question from uh, it's a UK-based pharmaceutical company. Um, the person is asking, who should register on the MHRA portal, us or our UK-based CRO? Okay, good question. Um, it's up to you to decide, really. Um, as I mentioned, um, the um, depends how you want to set it up. Um, the CRO, as the applicant, can register, um, or as a sponsor, you can register, and then you can add um, a, the CRO as an external user. Um, if you do it that way, then obviously you have more oversight, um, and also you have visibility of the submissions made by the CRO related to your company. Okay, great, good answer, thank you. Um, okay, finally, just while we've got a few minutes left, um, how about a question from another EU-based farmer? The question is exactly what is our five-digit company number? Over to you, Louise. Okay, yeah, so um, this is the number that, um, so when you apply to the MHRA, um, either if you make a marketing authorization or clinical trial submission, um, the MHRA assigns your company a specific number and you'll see if you look at the correspondence you get from the MHRA, there's on there, there will be CTA number and it's the first five digits of this. So as I mentioned, if, um, if your pharmaceutical industry, um, it, this is the first five digits um, of your product licensing number. Um, and then for clinical trial applicants, this is the first five digits of your CTA number, as I mentioned. Um, if you haven't submitted, if you are a sponsor or a pharmaceutical company that's been using CROs um, and they've submitted in the past, but you haven't um, and you now want to um, register with the portal, then you can email the MHRA. Um, I don't know the email off by heart, but um, if you look on the MHRA, on the MHRA website, sorry, there is, um, there is an email there that you can use to register. Excellent presentation and a great answers to follow. So unfortunately, this is all the time we have for the question section today. Uh, however, we would like to answer everyone who has taken the time to ask. So we will endeavour to reply personally via email to all outstanding questions by the end of this week. And now to conclude our webinar session for today, we'd like to thank everyone once again for joining us. We hope you found this presentation helpful. Uh, to remind all our listeners that the webinar will be available for download from the Ergomed website from tomorrow. Plus, we'll also have a link in our next newsletter.
this ends our webinar session. Thank you very much for joining us.